Good afternoon. It is good to be back together. I am so thankful to be here and to see so many friendly faces and old friends. You know, my dad and I were talking last night on the way back to the hotel, the different styles that different preachers have, and it is very interesting the different ways people present the word. I looked out and I saw Brother Taylor, and he certainly has a unique way of doing a presentation. I remember two years ago during the power lectureship, I was in the hospital, and the very last night, it did my heart good. I was able to get out my iPad in the hospital bed and watch Brother Taylor present his lesson at the Power Lectures, and I was so very thankful for that. I was thinking about Cliff. Every time Cliff speaks, it is always very deep. It is rich, and it's deep, and I love to listen to Cliff. It always benefits me spiritually to hear him. I have gone a number of places and I have been told numerous times by people that when they hear me speak they say they love my videos they say we listen to them as we go to sleep at night <laughs> I have not known what to make of that because I have been told that repeatedly but maybe that does mean something that is true I'm going to begin by reading to you something from the United States Navy it says it is 2 a.m on the Navy destroyer, the USS Trayer. The air is thick with the smell of fuel and 350 sweaty recruits who have been working too many hours. It's another long, monotonous shift of routine maintenance, and suddenly the night is ripped open by the piercing wail of an emergency alarm. The USS Trayer is under attack. Explosions rock the ship as fires burn and the anguished cries of the injured fill the air. To escape the flames, the flooding, and the thick smoke, the men and women of the crew scramble through the mangled compartments past gruesomely torn bodies. Lights flicker, turbines whine, metal rips, and the relentless scream of the alarms tell everyone what they already know. This is war, except it's not. And then the article goes on to say, you see, the USS Trayer is not a real ship. It is a training vessel inside of a 90,000 gallon tank at the Navy Recruit Command in Illinois. It has been nicknamed the unluckiest ship in the Navy. The USS Trayer runs these attack drills on almost a daily basis. They last for 12 hours. They are designed to be realistic attacks, stressful attacks, and terrifying attacks. The article concludes with these words, it all seems so real as if it were an actual maritime siege, but it's not. And then it says this, except for the enemy that is, the enemy fear is real. Friends, the United States military spends millions of dollars every year to train its soldiers to manage and to overcome fear. Because they understand that when soldiers give in to fear, they run from the enemy. They understand when soldiers give in to fear that we lose battles, soldiers go AWOL, and people die. Truly, fear is the great enemy of soldiers. And while it's true that fear is a deadly and devastating obstacle to the armies of the world, its consequences are even more severe for the armies of God. Friends, there is no place in God's army for the fearful. You know, Judges chapter 7 and verse 3, God instructed Gideon concerning the men of his army. He said, whoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. We're talking this session about fear and particularly overcoming fear because it is a crippling emotion. While I was preparing this lesson, I did some research on fear and I found there are a lot of different kinds of fear. In fact, if you look up phobias, there is a fear of just about everything you can think of. I read that there are at least 322 unique phobias that have been identified. Some of the top ones include, number nine was brontophobia. That's not the fear of brontosauruses, it's the fear of thunderstorms. Number five, this one gets me, I've got this one bad, claustrophobia. 
That is the fear of being trapped in confined spaces. I could tell you stories about MRIs since my accident. Number one, could you guess what number one is? Number one is it affects half of all women and many men. It is arachnophobia. That is the fear of spiders. And here's one, this is a real one, it's on the list. I certainly hope you don't have this one. Homilophobia is the fear of sermons. That's a real fear. Now, you know, the fear of spiders and the fear of tight spaces ultimately might not be that big a deal. But the type of fear that we're talking about this hour is very, very serious. Because this type of fear is deadly. It is the type of fear described in Revelation 21 and verse 8 where the Bible says that the fearful will have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I decided that in my opinion, the number one biggest problem in the Lord's church today is fear. Now somebody might say, no, Don, I think it's ignorance. Don, I think it's apathy. I think it is worldliness. And I certainly wouldn't want to argue with anyone on any of these counts, but I know that when the Lord gives the list of those who are going to be in hell in Revelation 21, he doesn't start the list with the apathetic. He doesn't start the list with the ignorant. He starts the list with the fearful. The New King James says, the cowardly. I know that because of fear, people don't approach others about the gospel. Because of fear, people don't want to serve in the worship services. Because of fear, people don't obey Matthew 18. They don't go to a brother who sinned against them. Because of fear, elders don't rebuke false teachers, preachers don't preach on controversial subjects, churches don't do evangelism, support missionaries, build buildings, spend money in things that they need to do in the Lord's service because of fear. I know the one-talent man was cast into the outer darkness, not because he was a one-talent man, but because of fear. I want to begin and give the definition of fear. We need to understand that there are two different types of fear. Dictionary.com defines fear this way, a distressing emotion aroused by impending danger. And so it's an emotion caused by danger, and then it says real or imagined. Then it gives definition number two. It says reverential awe, especially toward God. You know, it's Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 13, fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. I want to make a point of clarification. Sometimes I hear people say this. They say, we should fear God. That means we should have reverential awe, not the other type of fear. They say we shouldn't be afraid of God. I've heard that a lot of times. Brethren, I don't agree with that. The Bible teaches there's a time and there's a sense in which we should be afraid of God. Is that not Matthew 10 and verse 28? Don't fear him who's able to kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who's able to destroy both the body and soul in hell? That's not talking about reverential awe. That's talking about a fear for my eternal soul. Does not Philippians 2 and verse 12 say, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. This is terror. There is a trembling that is right and that is proper for me to do and to be as I stand in the face of the almighty creator. The definition of fear. Number two, I want to talk about the destructive nature of fear. Now I've got 10 sub points. I may cut some out here. I'll watch my time. But number one, I want to suggest to you that fear is destructive because number one, it exhibits a lack of trust in God. In Numbers chapters uh, 13 and 14, the children of Israel have come to the edge of the promised land. They've sent in the 12 spies, and you remember they came back with the message, oh, it is a great land. It is flowing with milk and honey, grapes and pomegranates and, and figs. And Joshua and Caleb said, it is a great land. Let's go and take it. Chapter 14 and verse 9, they said, the Lord is with us. Fear them not. But the other spies said, we're not able to go up against these men. They are bigger than us. We, they're giants. We are grasshoppers in their sight. Their walls are tall. They're going to kill us. You know, in Deuteronomy chapter 1, Moses is speaking to the people, and he says this, I told you not to be afraid. God will fight for you. Listen to what he says in verse 32. Yet for all of that, you did not believe God. Now, what's the connection here? 
when you are doubting God, when you are having this type of fear, he says it's because you don't have faith. You are doubting God. When we exhibit this type of fear, we have a lack of trust in God. Brethren, when we let our fear stop us from doing the Lord's work, it exhibits a lack of trust in Him. How many elderships will sit on money in the bank while there are souls that need to be saved and work that needs to be done because they're afraid that the air conditioning is going to go out. They're afraid the building, that the roof's going to blow off the building. That's what insurance is for. Number two, a lack of tr or a fear is destructive because it prevents growth. Now, it prevents growth on a personal level. It does it on a congregational level. On a personal level, some people never grow because of their fear. They never become Bible class teachers. They never develop into leaders. They never become soul winners because they're afraid they might say the wrong thing. They're afraid somebody's going to ask them a question they can't answer. You know, there's a very interesting passage we know well. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15 says, To be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. But you know, the first part of this verse, I want you to make note of because it really says something powerful. In fact, I think this is the most powerful point in this lesson. He says, but sanctify the Lord God in your heart and be ready always to give an answer. Immediately before Peter says, sanctify the Lord God in your heart, Peter gives a list of things that might intimidate Christians and make them shirk their Christian responsibility. In verse 13, he talks about those who would harm you. In verse 14, he talks about suffering for righteousness' sake. And then he says, don't be afraid. He says, but sanctify the Lord God in your heart. What does the word sanctify mean? It means to set apart. What he is saying is you set God apart in your heart where he should be. You have a proper view of God as almighty and all-powerful, as the judge of the universe. And get this, when you think about God the way you ought to think about God, he says, then be ready to give an answer. What does that mean? When you think about God for who he is and what he is, then the fear will melt away and you can do the work you're supposed to do. Number three, fear is destructive because it is selfish. Now somebody says, what do you mean by that? I don't think fear is selfish. Fear is what keeps people from stepping out of their comfort zones. Fear is what keeps people from stretching themselves. I'm afraid. You know, there's an amazing thing, and that is people who are great leaders, they don't start out as great leaders. They grew to that point. They stretched themselves. They educated themselves. They practiced to that point. Do you remember what Moses said in the, in the beginning? Exodus chapter 3 and verse 11. He said, who am I that I should do this? Chapter 4 and verse 1, he said, they're not going to believe me. They're not going to listen to me. Chapter 4 and verse 10, he said, I'm not an eloquent man. I'm not a great speaker. Do you remember what God said to Moses? Chapter 4 and verse 14, the Bible says, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said unto him, Take Aaron, and I will be with you. And in essence, he said, Go and do what I told you to do. That is, stop being afraid and do what I said to do. You see, fear can make me selfish. Next, I'll skip some of these. Number four, fear allows sin to spread in the church. Brethren, many times leaders in the Lord's church don't practice discipline because of fear. They say, what kind of fear? Sometimes it's fear of confrontation. Sometimes it's a fear that, you know, we might uh, have a drop in contribution. Sometimes it's a fear of losing people. And so sin becomes ignored. And, you know, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 6, in response to that, do you not know that a little leaven leavens a whole lump? That is, you can ignore the sin, but it's going to spread. All too often it has been the case that elderships don't stop the mouths of false teachers because of fear. Did you know that one of the qualifications of an elder is courage? Now you might say, I don't, you know, I've read 1 Timothy 3, I've read Titus chapter 1, I don't remember courage being in that list. But you know in Titus chapter 1, immediately after giving the qualifications of elders, in verse 9 the Bible says, holding fast the faithful word as he's been taught, speaking of that elder, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort 
and to convict those who contradict. Now listen, for there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, now listen, whose mouths must be stopped. One of the duties of, his, of an elder is that he must have backbone. He has to have courage. And if he doesn't have that, he is not qualified to do the job of an elder. We've got too many soft elders who don't have the courage to stand up and do the job that God has given them. And one reason why false teachers have continued to do so much damage in local churches is because elders don't have the backbone to stop them. If you want to stop a false teacher from preaching false doctrine, you know what you do? You take away his pulpit. Next, number five, fear is damaging, it's destructive because it feeds bad behavior. Why did Pilate crucify Jesus? Have you ever thought about the fact it's because he was afraid of the people? He was afraid of an uprising. He was afraid of losing control. Why did Paul publicly rebuke Peter to his face in Galatians chapter 2? You say, well, Don, that was because of racism. That was because of prejudice against the Gentiles. Yeah, but why? Galatians 2 and verse 12 says the reason he behaved that way is because he feared the Jews. Probably he was afraid what they might say about him, you know, it's peer pressure and what they're going to think. Maybe we should call it fear pressure instead of peer pressure. How many young people start drinking because of fear? How many young people start smoking because of fear? That is fear what other people are going to think about them or not going to think about them. How many young girls have sex because, before marriage because of fear? This young man's going to say he doesn't love her, he's going to turn against her. It's this fear. Oftentimes, fear of what other people is go are going to think drives us into sin. Let me skip ahead to the next one for the sake of time. Number six, fear is contagious. You want to talk about destructive? Not only does fear do the things we've already talked about, fear has a tendency to spread. Go back to the border of the promised land. Ten of the spies, they came back and they said, oh, the people are too big, they're too tall, there's no way we can possibly take the land. The very next verse, the first verse of chapter 14 and verse 1 is interesting because the ten spies said this and the Bible says, and all of the congregation lifted up their voice and cried and all of the people wept that night. Brethren, oftentimes the fear of one elder will permeate the entire eldership and the result is the work doesn't get done. Number seven, fear is destructive and this is where the rubber meets the road because it will destroy the soul. Revelation 21.8, the fearful top the list of those who will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. Matthew 25.25, 25, the one talent man said, I was afraid, and he went and hid the talent in the ground. Verse 30 says, and he was cast into the outer darkness where there were, where was weeping and gnashing of teeth. All right, we've talked about the definition of fear. We've talked about the destructive nature of fear, and i got to get moving here. Here's the last point, the dismissal of fear. How do you get rid of this? It doesn't do us any good to talk about these other things unless we know how to deal with it. You know, if a man is going to have meekness, he'll likely study Moses. If a man's going to have patience, he'll study Job. And if a man's going to have courage, who better to study than David? And so I want you to open your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 17, and we'll study that for just a minute. Brother Mosier would say that's on page 311. 1 Samuel chapter 17. Here is Israel. They're paralyzed by fear because their arch enemy, the Philistines, were armed for war against them. The Philistines are on one hillside. The Israelites are on the other hillside. There is a valley between them. And every day the champion of the Philistines would come out and he would mock Israel. His name is Goliath. He was two feet taller than Shaquille O'Neal. I looked this up recently. It said he is two feet and two inches taller than the tallest player in the NBA. He is decked out in body armor that weighs 125 pounds. He's got a javelin and a spear. Out in front of him, he's got a shield bearer. And each day, in fact twice a day, Goliath would come out and he would extend a challenge. Verse 10, he said, I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man that we may fight together. The word defy is interesting. It is used six times. 
It literally means to treat with contempt or scorn, to taunt, to ridicule, listen, to humiliate. Goliath would come out twice a day and humiliate the armies of God. What he was proposing was a one-on-one -on -one contest, winner take all. Each side sent a representative to the valley. We would fight if the Philistines win, the uh, Israelites surrender, and vice versa. The problem was nobody wanted to engage this giant. Verse 11 says, because they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Verse 16 tells us this had been going on for a while. Every morning for 40 days, Goliath had done this. This means 80 times Goliath had come out and humiliated and defied them. Now, King Saul is their leader. 1 Samuel 9 and verse 2 says that from his shoulders upward, he was taller than most of the people. That means he is a tall guy. They only come up to his shoulders. He is a specimen. He is a big man himself. But 1 Samuel 17 and verse 11 says he's terrified of Goliath. All of the warriors of Israel are terrified of Goliath. Again, fear is contagious. But here comes David. He is the youngest of eight brothers. He's been out taking care of the sheep. And his father asked him to run an errand. Three of his oldest brothers are on the battlefield. And so his dad wants him to go and get a report how things are, are coming and, and also to take some supplies. And so David shows up and he's got some bread, some grain, and ten chunks of cheese. And, and you know the rest of the story. It is probably one of, if not the best known story in the Bible. David steps in courageously. He challenges Goliath. He wins a great victory. But what I want to focus on right now is the courage of David. How did David have such courage when every other man in Israel was stricken with fear? Because if we can glean some answers to this question, then we will have some great tools to help us overcome fear. Five things, very briefly. How was David so fearless? Number one, brethren, David drew on God's past faithfulness. I want you to look at verse number 37. When speaking to King Saul, David tells him in the past, he said he'd killed a lion and a bear. Listen to what he says. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. What I'm saying is this. To overcome fear, draw on God's past faithfulness. I consider the times that God has blessed me in the past, that he has answered my prayers. I believe that oftentimes providentially the things that have gone on in the past are God preparing us for the future. I consider God's faithfulness when I read about the heroes of the Bible. I read about the Hebrews chapter 11 and the great hall of faith and then chapter 12 and verse 1 he says since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses let us lay aside every weight and sin which doth so easily beset and run with patience endurance the race that is before us. What is he saying? He's saying, draw from them. Look at these heroes. Look at David and Goliath. And I draw from the past to help me face my fear. Why should I be afraid to tackle a certain task? The same God who enabled David to beat Goliath is the same God that I serve. Number two, what can I draw from David? David did not let pressure from other people stop him. When David arrives on the scenes, his brothers are there in the camp. It's day 40, and while he is there, Goliath comes out, and he starts his daily rant. And some of the Israelites say to David, have you seen this giant? Twice a day he comes out, and he taunts us. And the king said, whoever kills him, he's going to make him rich. And David says, who is this guy? How dare he say this about the living God? And David's brother, Eliab, becomes enraged. And he says, David, who's keeping the sheep? Get back to the sheep. And then to top it, first he says, you're just a shepherd. We're soldiers, you're just a shepherd. Then to top it off, he, uh, he attacks his character. He says, we know your heart. You're conceited and you're wicked. You're just down here to watch the battle. Go home, little brother. He's belittling David. Eliab is a warrior. David's a keeper of sheep. Brethren, sometimes comments like this are exactly what keep people from launching out in the service of God. And this is family. 
Sometimes it is those who are closest to us, who mean the most to us, that will criticize us and instill fear in us. You know, many times elders have been ready to take home a task, take on a task, until they go home and they talk to their wives and then they come back afraid. You think that's ever happened or am I making that up? You know, I have to wonder if here it is, David, he's standing here in front of Goliath, his own brother is mocking him. I have to wonder if standing up to his brother shows a greater exhibition of courage than standing up to Goliath. After being bullied by his brother, King Saul hears about David's courage, and he sends for him. And David says, I'll fight the Philistine. What does Saul say to him? He says, you can't fight him. You're just a kid. What do you do with that? I'm telling you what he did was he looked beyond it and he pressed ahead. That's what we've got to do. Number three, what did David do to overcome fear? David saw, this is maybe my favorite one, David saw God, not Goliath. I don't mean he didn't see Goliath. Goliath's almost 10 feet tall. I mean, you've got to see him. This is a matter of perspective, and sometimes that's our problem. We need to change our perspective. That's what I'm talking about, 1 Peter 3, 15. Sanctify the Lord God in your heart. Change your perspective. Think of God the right way for who he is and what he is, and then be ready to give an answer to every man. And so David saw God, not Goliath. Everybody else, somebody said, somebody said this, I thought it was good. Everybody else thought Goliath was too big to hit. David thought he was too big to miss. And here's the reason. Twice a day, Goliath would come out and taunt the people. And most of the soldiers looked at him. They're intimidated by his size and his strength and his armor and his words. That's all they see. What is interesting is none of them even mention God. Now listen to David. If you count the number of times that David mentions Goliath, he mentions him two times. Now listen when he mentions God. Verse number 26, he says, the armies of the living God. Verse 36, the armies of the living God. Verse 45, the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel. 46, the Lord will deliver you into my hand. And he says that all the earth may know that there's a God in Israel. 47, the Lord does not deliver by sword or spear, for the battle is the Lord, and he will give you into our hands. In fact, David mentions God nine times in this passage compared to the two times that he mentions Goliath. Brethren, we would go a long way to overcome our fear if our God thoughts outnumbered our Goliath thoughts four to one. Romans 8 and verse 31, what shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? And Philippians 4.13 gets abused oftentimes. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That doesn't relate to football, by the way. I can do all things through God who strengthens me. Ultimately, I can be faithful and I can go to heaven because God is there who strengthens me. I've got to see God, not Goliath. Here's the next one, and this is going to be the conclusion. I'm going to wrap this up. Friends, the United States military spends millions of dollars a year training soldiers to face and overcome fear. And the reason is this. They understand if they don't, the result is going to be failed missions and a loss of life. But fear in God's army has even heavier consequences, and that is a loss of souls in eternity. Thank you for your good attention. We're doing an invitation this hour, right, Wade? Yes, sir. It may be that we have someone here who needs to respond to the Lord's invitation. If you are here and you need to obey the gospel, the Bible teaches to become a child of God, to be added to the Lord's church, to be forgiven of your sins. You need to hear the gospel, believe it, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Christ, and be baptized in water for the remission of your sins. If you want to study that where we can open the Bible and show you book, chapter, and verse, please say the word. Maybe you're ready to do that today. Confess your faith and be immersed in water for the remission of your sins. We're ready to assist you. Maybe you are a member of the Lord's Church and you have matters that you need to take care of publicly. You desire the prayers of your brethren on your behalf. If that is the case, we would count it a great honor if we could go and pray for you at this time. If you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, won't you come as together we stand and sing the invitation song.